Hi, this is my presentation on microalgae for biofuel for Environmental 479 History of Energy at the University of Idaho and my name is Sarah Tanyan. What are microalgae? Broadly speaking, microalgae are defined as microscopic algae belonging to the kingdom Protista, which is restricted to prokaryotes, simple unicellular organisms, mainly bacteria and cyanobacteria, otherwise known as blue-green algae. They're phototrophic, so they utilize the sun for energy by performing photosynthesis and are highly adapted to marine or freshwater environments. They have neither tissue specialization nor internal cellular organelles, but they do have a nucleus for genetic material which may or may not be membrane bound. They also have ribosomes for protein synthesis, but those are found existing freely throughout the cytoplasm rather than attached to the endoplasmic reticulum as in the more advanced eukaryotic cells. Microalgae can exist as individuals or they can colonize into large groups or chains that can become visible to the naked eye. Professor of Microbiology, Balajit Saharan, if I pronounce that correctly, who wrote an article in a scholarly journal on algal biofuel production, defines microalgae more specifically in terms of energy as unicellular autotrophic organisms that can convert carbon dioxide into lipids, which after esterification can be utilized as an energy source. Esterification is a chemical reaction involving alcohol. So to summarize, microalgae are the simplest of unicellular organisms that perform photosynthesis can form colonies and produce lipids, which may be harvested for energy. What is biofuel? Biofuel is fuel that comes from biomass, and biomass generally refers to organic plant matter. According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado, there are two common types of biofuel. The first is ethanol, which is alcohol made from feedstocks. This is done by fermenting the starches and sugars, or carbohydrates, in a process very similar to brewing beer. The top three feedstocks with the highest yield of fuel per acre are sugar beet, sugar cane, and cassava. But here in the States, corn is the familiar crop for ethanol production, and the U.S. is a top ethanol producer worldwide. Other crops also include sorghum, wheat, and potatoes, Pretty much anything with cellulose can be used to make ethanol. The second type of biofuel is biodiesel, and this comes from combining alcohol, usually methanol, with oils from plants, and this is used as a diesel substitute. The top three yields per acre here are palm, coconut, and canola. Any oil that can be used as a vegetable cooking oil will work to make biodiesel and this also includes recycled cooking oil. So there's no fermentation process here, rather this is a series of chemical reactions called esterification, which also yields soap and glycerol as byproducts. This is where microalgae come in because algae produces oils and certain species can produce quite a bit of it. The Aquatic Species Program is a program of the United States Department of Energy. The Department of Energy was created in 1977 under the Carter Administration in response to international fuel shortages, which later became known as the Energy Crises of the 70s. There was an oil embargo placed on the United States during a war in the Middle East in 1973, and the price of oil quadrupled in only three months. Even after the embargo was lifted a year later, prices remained high, as did insecurities with future supplies in oil. The United States started looking for a way out of dependence on fossil fuels, and the creation of the Department of Energy is a part of Jimmy Carter's legacy. Several investigative programs were born under this branch of government dedicated to the research and development of alternative energy. One of these programs was the Biofuels Program, Biofuels are subdivided into categories, and microalgae are considered to be third generation. First generation are the ethanol and biodiesel discussed in the previous slide. 
fuels that are derived from food crops and that have reached commercial level production. Second generation fuels are residue from agriculture and forestry processing. The non-edible components like wood chips, stems, leaves, or seed casings from traditional food and non-food crops. But these tend to have low conversion rates. Third generation is specific to the thousands of species of microalgae. And these actually have a legitimate potential for commercial use, depending on the species and the methodology. The downsides are that algal ponds for large scale production would require a lot of space and that would compete with arable land for food crops and that the production and conversion process is quite energy intensive. The aquatic species program collected and studied thousands of species of microalgae, looking in particular for the ones that produced a lot of oil and that could do so under harsh conditions. The collection was eventually narrowed down to around 300 species, mostly green algae. Protista are the most primitive form of plant cells, and because of their simple cellular structure, microalgae are remarkably more efficient at photosynthesis than their terrestrial cousins. They have high growth rates, undergoing cell multiplication several times a day, and have light to biomass, have high light to biomass conversion rates. On average, microalgae produce around 30 times more oil per unit of land and can grow under a variety of conditions. This table compares oil yields between conventional vegetable oligonous crops and microalgae. The units are described in liters per hectare. As you can see, the amount of oil that comes from corn, the most popular feedstock used to make biodiesel in the US, dwarfs in comparison to that of microalgae. This photo here is courtesy of Marek Mies of Poland. He's one of the contest winners for impressive images of the smallest things on earth. And this is a species of algae near a leaf undergoing cell division. Originally, the aquatic species program had imagined monocultures of algal ponds on land not dissimilar to the conventional farming of traditional crops. The image on the right is not an actual aquaculture facility, rather it's an artist rendition of a concept image for what a full-blown operation could look like in the future. These types of ponds are called open raceway ponds. The other image on the bottom is the real deal. It's the Solix biofuels plant on the Southern Ute Indian Reservation in Southwest Colorado. So this is actually happening, just not on a level that can compete with fossil fuels yet. Microalgae require four main inputs. Sunlight is the most important since photosynthesis cannot occur without it. Remember we're talking regular active photosynthesis here, not C4 or CAM. Those would be eukaryotic cells. So for optimal activity, access to unobstructed sunlight is very important. And so the location would have to be somewhere out in a wide open space, like the deserts, as you see pictured here. Water is the medium in which microalgae thrive. But an interesting element here is that the water need not be unadulterated. It can be wastewater from other sources like municipal treatment centers, agriculture, or feedlots. This is because the algae get their nutrients directly from the water, which ties us into the next input. The nutrients required by microalgae are often the same nutrients that are present in waste effluent, like sewage, and contain significant amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen, which are required for microalgal growth. Carbon dioxide is another input, and microalgae have a natural ability to sequester large amounts of carbon for the photosynthetic process. It was propositioned from the start to utilize CO2 from other waste streams since microalgae were recognized as the sequestering candidate with the highest carbon fixing capabilities. If the aquaculture facility were built in proximity to an industrial plant, then the flue gases could be siphoned through pipes to the algal ponds rather than released into the atmosphere. Okay, so after the microalgae have been cultivated to maximum growth, then comes the harvesting and extraction. Harvesting means removing the algae from the ponds and dewatering it. 
This can be done by a variety of methods, all of which depend on several factors like species selection, density, size, culture method, and other physiochemical conditions. Some common methods are centrifugation, which uses centrifugal forces to separate biomass from the water by density difference. It's fast and reliable, but is also limited to small scale operations. Gravity sedimentation is exactly what it sounds like. The algal particles eventually become large enough that they succumb to the forces of gravity and settle to the bottom of the pond. This could be applicable to large scale harvesting, but it is limited to strains with high sedimentation rates. Flocculation uses chemicals to induce aggregation. The individual cells are forced out of suspension and glom onto each other, creating clumps. Flocculation is often used as an additional step to improve other methods like centrifugation, sedimentation, filtration, etc. These are not all of the harvesting techniques, but they are a few of the most popular ones. Extraction means separating the lipids from the cells, but first you have to break open the cell. And this is also achieved by various methods, depending on the same set of factors, species selection, size, and so forth. Mechanical extractions uses physical means like grinding or crushing, also known as bead beading, in which the algal slurry is spun at very high speeds with fine beads to impose direct damage on the cell. Ultrasound uses wave action to disturb the integrity of the cell wall. Microwaves heat the cell and induce intracellular water vapor to disrupt the cell from within. Electroporation uses electricity to alter the conductivity and permeability of the cell wall. These mechanical methods generally include high capital and maintenance costs, require skilled personnel, and inefficient lipid yields can be inconsistent. Chemical extraction uses solvents to dissolve the cell wall usually hexane, benzene, or chloroform compounds. There are different techniques, the flock method, the Bly and Dyer method, among others. Basically, the algal slurry is washed repeatedly in a solvent mixture until it undergoes phase separation, whereupon the lipid layer is then easily extracted. This method is very effective. However, at the commercial level, using solvents will pose significant environmental and health risks. Biological. This primarily consists of enzyme-assisted extraction. Enzymes like cellulase and trypsin degrade the polymers on the cell surface, which then facilitates other means of extractions, mainly mechanical. This method is expensive, but at least it is safe and effective. Obviously, there are advantages and challenges in microalgae aquaculture. Most of the advantages occur during the upstream process or the cultivation side of operations. Probably the biggest benefit of all is that it can use the outputs of other waste streams as inputs to its own. This is a huge concept in sustainability science because it embraces a closed waste cycle concept rather than a linear one. Then you have the carbon sequestering capacity of microalgae. The fact that a great deal of carbon can be assimilated by photosynthesis is quite an attractive payoff, considering that flue gases are one of the top anthropogenic contributors to global warming and climate change. According to the EPA, the industrial sector contributed to 21% of all U.S. greenhouse gases in 2014. For a typical 200 megawatt hour natural gas-fired power plant, it has been estimated that an algal pond of 3,600 acres would be sufficient to capture 80% of the plant's CO2 emissions during daylight hours. As for the water, wastewater from treatment centers that would otherwise be released into the environment would undergo additional cleansing since the microalgae would remove any excess nutrients as a part of their growth cycle. This is what happens naturally in eutrophicated waters, except in cultivation, it would be done on purpose in a controlled environment. Then we have the fact that microalgae have superior lipid yields than terrestrial food crops. And if we could get this to large scale operation, we can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. There are a lot of vehicles that use diesel, especially commercial fleets like trucking companies that transport commodities, USPS, U-Haul, buses all for example. 
According to the EIA, the Energy Administ Information Administration, diesel accounted for 21% of the fuel used by the transportation sector in 2016. That's nearly a quarter. Lastly, microalgae would not compete with resources for food. There's only so much arable land to grow food. Arable means land capable of being plowed and used to grow crops. And currently, these crops have the dual purpose of providing both food and fuel. Introducing microalgae into the picture would lessen the percentage of vegetable crops used for fuel and increase the percentage that goes toward food, which is something to think about since the global population continues to grow. As for challenges, these mainly pose issues in the downstreaming process of harvesting and extraction, which are significant because they have to do a lot with money. Initial investments are expensive, as is the maintenance. Procedures can be labor intensive and time consuming, and overall the farming procedure is considered to be costly and complicated. Water as an input would have to be trucked in and this poses additional costs, as do the uncertainties of being able to locate a facility next to an industrial plant for carbon capture. Location is a big challenge. You need thousands of acres of wide open space that is also non-arable and in a temperate climate, so extremely northern or southern locations are out. Probably the biggest underlying challenges is that our understanding and technology for commercial level production is still a fairly new science. While terrestrial crop production and harvesting have many centuries of developmental history, algal biofuels technology is at best described as incomplete. Of particular concern is avoidance of culture contamination and population crashes. So this is where Omega steps in. Meet Jonathan Trent. He has a PhD in biological oceanography and has made careers at various institutions working in biochemistry, molecular medicine, astrobiology, nanotechnology, and biomolecular engineering. Currently, he is the head project scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center and credited as the inventor of the OMEGA project, which stands for Offshore Membrane Enclosures for Growing Algae. The basic concept of Omega is that it grows microalgae in large flexible plastic tubes called photobioreactors that float in the sea and allow for solar radiation to penetrate through for photosynthesis. The mechanics of the system use wastewater and carbon dioxide to grow algae in the plastic tubes, which have internal mechanisms that constantly monitor and regulate growth, while the spatial configuration of the design allows for convenience and accessibility when harvesting the microalgae. This link is to a 15 minute video featured on TED Talks called Energy from Floating Alg Algae Ponds and was filmed at the TED Global Conference in June 2012. Jonathan is the speaker and he introduces his Omega project and his team's vision of the future. It really is a fascinating video if you have the time to watch. You can tell that he's dedicated to his work and that he truly believes we can have a future free of fossil fuels. Photobioreactors, or PBRs, create artificial environments that cultivate phototrophic organisms and are currently used to grow a variety of species like plants, mosses, microalgae, and bacteria. They allow for the controlled supply of specific environmental conditions and allow for higher growth rates and purity levels than could be found in a natural habitat. Omega's PBRs float in the ocean and have a unique design in that they're made from sheets of polyethylene with water permeable selective membranes incorporated into their surfaces. Because the membranes are selective to an osmotic gradient, the water will only move in one direction and this means they can perform the passive action of forward osmosis. Microalgae cleanse the wastewater as they grow, which was once freshwater. The cleansed freshwater moves across the membranes of the PBRs into the saline environment of the ocean, but never the other way around. This is a key component of the design, since oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis, and the microalgae would suffocate, so to speak, in the PBRs if too much oxygen remained in the water. 
In this way, omega utilizes the free energy of forward osmosis to draw oxygenated water out of the tubes and releases it into the ocean, which increases overall net productivity and energy efficiency. The PBRs also have internal environmental controls like pumps, swirl vanes, paddle wheels, flow meters, and sensors to monitor oxygen, CO2 levels, pH, and temperature. The tubes are shaped like a raceway so that the water moves in a circular pattern through the pumps and sensors. They float in the ocean but are anchored to the floor. And in this way, offshore sites can take advantage of the free services offered by the ocean, like thermal stability and wave action for mixing. Water has a high specific heat, also known as a heat sink, meaning that it's slow to heat up and slow to cool down and so it can maintain a constant range of temperature fairly well. The natural wave action of the ocean can help to mix and distribute the nutrients and gases into the matrix of the microalgae. These two factors decrease the amount of energy the system would need to operate that might otherwise be required for heaters, thermostats, or additional pumps. Omega has the potential to mitigate some of the challenges that we face with land-based aquaculture. First, it can save some money associated with operational costs. For example, there are the free energy concepts discussed in the previous slide with the PBRs, and Omega plans to utilize the support structure itself, like the walkways and framework, as a platform for other assemblages, like solar panels and windmills, so that the entire Omega system can be powered by renewable energy and become self-sustaining. Other aquaculture farms could partner with Omega to share space and other costs like permits or paying employees. Another way to save money would be the costs associated with the transportation of inputs like wastewater and maybe even flue gases, which would normally have to be trucked into a land facility somewhere out in the desert or on open land. The amount of wastewaters that Omega would require in order to produce a level of biomass that could compete with fossil fuels would need to come from a larger municipal treatment center, most likely located in an urban area. Urban areas tend to have coastal locations, and so water treatment centers and industry would, in all likelihood, be near the ocean where an Omega system could be built. According to Trent, quote, if you look at where most of the wastewater treatment plants are, they're embedded in the cities. In the USA, 23 of the 25 most densely populated counties are located on the coasts, and all these areas discharge large quantities of wastewater effluent into adjacent coastal waters. The lower image on this slide shows the relationship between the municipal treatment center and the offshore algae facility. I couldn't find an image that also showed a flue gas input, but perhaps it would be siphoned in my pipe in much the same way as wastewater. Another challenge that would mi be mitigated is the matter of space. On land, some of the smaller sites only take up a few acres, but their purpose of algal production is for small-scale use in personal care products, dietary supplements, animal feed, etc. Much larger aerial dimensions would be required for biofuel purposes, and one such site, located in Australia, extends to greater than 500 acres. For comparison, that's roughly equal to 380 football fields. The amount of land that open ponds would need in order to reach the scale of global biofuel production is difficult to predict and visualize, but clearly far from insignificant, especially when site selection is limited to climate and non-arable land, as was previously stated. Omega circumvents this problem because their sites are located in the ocean. In this image of San Francisco, the skinny green rectangle is about 1,280 acres. There is a downside to this, and that is that there would be conflicts with other stakeholders like fishermen and shipping ports. Another advantage is in the harvesting stage, which is a current challenge in downstream processing. The photobioreactors, the PBRs, are connected to a gas exchange and harvesting column, 
which supplies wastewater and dissolved oxygen by bubbling it into the water at a recirculation point. The shape and positioning of the gas exchange and harvesting column will provide a settling chamber for the algae that fall out of suspension in the water on the return trip to the PBR. The microalgae are then harvested through a manual drain valve located at the bottom of the settling chamber and afterwards the column is replenished with wastewater and goes back into circulation. This YouTube link is a six minute video of Omega's operational procedures at their test site including the harvesting chamber at the California Fish and Wildlife Laboratory in Santa Cruz. The Omega team is honest and open about the challenges they face. They are still in the beginning stages of development and only small prototype versions exist. So most of what Omega promises to be capable of delivering for commercial level production is largely theoretical. Though there is plenty of science to support the fact that microalgae do have the potential to transform the biofuels industry, the Omega pilot scale test programs lack sufficient quality data to back up their claims, which is mainly due to unsatisfactory experimental results. There have been manufacturer delays, and so the PBR design is incomplete or inadequate. Budget constraints have delayed pilot testing, and there have been permitting issues from regulatory agencies for environmental test sites, as well as stakeholder conflicts. Omega does not yet have an environmental impact statement, though they claim a life cycle assessment is underway. And presently the system still requires more energy than it produces and has been given an energy return on investment score of only 0.28. That's not very good. It has been suggested that biofuels with an EROI of less than three are impractical to deploy noting that fossil oil-based gasoline has an overall EROI of 5 to 10. So as Beal says here, it yet remains to be seen if algae biofuels can meet levels of profitability and become environmentally compatible. Fossil fuels are a non-renewable energy resource that have passed peak production. People are running out of time to come up with practical and sustainable solutions to ensure a future of global energy security. Microalgae have long been considered as a potential source of alternative fuel because of their ability to produce incredible amounts of natural oil, considerably more than oilseed crops. Even more notably, because of their high carbon sequestration capacity, they have the attractive dual purpose of providing fuel while reallocating excess carbon from the atmosphere into biomass and oxygen. While there are a multitude of product uses for algae, drawbacks to cultivation in open ponds on land, especially for the purpose of biofuel production, are that they compete with agriculture for arable land, and some procedures are economically inefficient due to the costs associated with both inputs and the downstream processing. Omega or offshore membrane enclosures for growing algae, claims that their system can mitigate most of these problems by growing microalgae in photobioreactor tubes that float in the ocean. In this way, microalgae can simultaneously treat human wastewater and capture waste carbon dioxide, all while running on wind and solar power. The Omega project seems to embody a cradle-to-cradle -cradle sustainable design but the total energy costs of the system still outweigh the benefits and further research and improvements are needed. Markedly, the Omega team at NASA is not interested in a patent. They do not care who gets the credit. They welcome any individual or group to improve upon any aspect of the Omega design or performance to make it real. <laughs>